Good morning, and I have to say I'm especially grateful that you are joining me today because today is my 60th birthday. Ah, that hurts to even say. How did I get to be so old so fast? But I have so much to praise God for today, truly. I am so grateful for the life that he has given me, that he has called me to, to be his servant. I'm so grateful for the many years that he has called me to study his word because what it's done for me is it's just put this treasure in my heart of God's truth and of the knowledge of him. I'm grateful even for the hardships, the losses, the griefs, the sorrows, the disappointments, because each of those sufferings have truly just driven my heart deeper in dependence upon him and strengthened my faith and given me such a confidence in his comfort and presence through whatever difficult things that we go through. And uh, I'm just so thankful that God has been purposeful with my life. I can see that he has written his gospel story over the pages of my life and it's beautiful. It's a beautiful life of redemption and, um, and a, a transformed heart. He has truly transformed my heart. So I guess the blessing of being 60 is looking back and seeing how faithful God has been, how trustworthy he is. But the other side of it is it just spotlights how short life is. Oh my, 60 years has gone by so fast. And I, I still feel like there's so much more that I want to do with my life and so many ways that I look forward to serving him. I mean, life is a precious gift. And today I'm grateful for the blessings uh, for the life that God has given me. But I'm also so keenly aware that life is short and the days are precious and few and and they're not to be wasted. They're just not to be wasted. So thank you for starting my birthday with me. Thank you for this new decade of life that you're starting with me as we get to think together about Jesus. And is there any better way to start the day than that? So we've been talking over the last couple of days about Jesus as the man of sorrows. And we see this aspect of his person as he agonizes in preparation for going to the cross. We've been looking at him in the Garden of Gethsemane over these past couple of days. We've seen him in prayer. Yesterday we saw his, his, his disciples, what happened when they fell asleep and didn't stay awake to pray. Now it's, it's very, very significant that Jesus is in this beautiful garden just before he goes to the cross. Because if you remember, it was in a garden where human history began. The first sin was committed in the Garden of Eden. The first Adam disobeyed God and brought sin and death into the human race and then was cast out of that garden forever. Eden is the garden of disobedience and sin. But now Jesus, the last Adam, obeys his father in the garden, in the Garden of Gethsemane, which has now become known for the Garden of Obedience and Submission. So today, grab your Bibles. We are turning to John chapter 18. We're looking at verses one through 11. And right away in verse two, we discover Judas. Now Judas, Judas was really familiar with this garden. As a disciple over the past three years, he'd been here with Jesus many times, Jesus and the other disciples. He, he knew that Jesus would be here on this night. Uh, Jesus knew that Judas would come for him here on this night. Jesus is fully in control as he led his disciples to this garden. Verse 2 of John chapter 18. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Wow. Okay. A band of soldiers is 600 men. Now, it's likely not all of them were in place in this small area, but clearly they are expecting resistance from Jesus. They come armed with weapons. Now, obviously they knew that Jesus had some kind of power. He had eluded their grasp time and time again, but Jesus never carried a weapon. He never harmed anybody. So what were they thinking? Were they thinking there was gonna be a riot of some kind? And now along with the soldiers, we learned that there's also some religious officials. So probably these are temple guards who worked in association with the chief priests. 
The Jewish officials had already determined that they were going to kill Jesus, but the problem was the Jews were under Roman domination, and so they had no power to execute people. If they wanted to kill Jesus, they knew they had to elicit the Romans to do the job for them. Well, look at verse 4. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? Okay, clearly this this mass display of force and firepower is completely unnecessary because Jesus walks right up to the soldiers to meet them. Now you can just imagine their shock as Jesus steps forward and boldly presents himself to them. Notice that Jesus is in complete control. He knew exactly what would happen. Now though he knew what they wanted, he still forced them to say it out loud. He forced them to state their business. You know, it's so interesting. He's even controlling the conversation. He is deliberately focused. He deliberately focuses them on himself, not on his disciples. So his question is very intentional to protect the disciples from any unnecessary involvement with all of this manpower, all of this weaponry, all of this, this instigation for some kind of a violent outburst. Verse five, it says, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth, and Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. This is an amazing moment. His response not only identifies him as the one that they're looking for, I'm the guy, but it also identifies him as Israel's God. He is the great I am. You know, any Jew who is well-versed in scripture would instantly recognize this phrase as the expression that God uses when he wants to reveal himself. This is the same phrase that God used with Moses by saying, who are you? I am. And now Jesus states, I am, I am he. Imagine then the power of these words that literally knocks the soldiers off their feet. If the, if the guards were so disabled by Jesus's mere words, we can be certain that no one could possibly lay a hand on Jesus without his own permission. Jesus was in absolute control of this situation. Now, as they stumble to get back up onto their feet, it was then that Judas kisses Jesus. Now this, of course, was a standard greeting in that culture for two people to greet each other with a kiss. But it's interesting that it's not necessary in this moment because Judas didn't need to give Jesus a kiss in order to identify him as the one that the soldiers were looking at because Jesus had already identified himself very effectively. But Jesus, Judas's kiss is still used as a weapon here rather than a sign of affection. It literally was a kiss of betrayal. Now Matthew reminds us that Jesus still called Judas friend, even as he submitted himself to be taken. In Matthew 26, verse 50, Jesus said to him, friend, do what you came to do. Then they came to lay hands on Jesus and seize him. It's interesting that no one has ever been able to lay hands on Jesus to arrest him before now. And now when they come in in mass with weapons, with an anticipation to fight, he disables them with three words, I am he. And in these three words, he reveals his majesty as God, the one to whom one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Well, if you go to verse seven, it says that, so he asked them again, whom do you seek? Isn't that interesting? He asked them again and they, and they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus told them, I told you that I am he. So after identifying himself again, Jesus now takes immediate steps to protect his own. You know, he is the good shepherd. He's the one who protects his sheep. So he strategically places himself between the wolves, the soldiers, and his sheep, the disciples. He says, so if you seek me, let these men go. Now, John remembers what Jesus had prayed earlier in the night. And early in the night, John records what he had prayed in John chapter 17, verse 12. Jesus prayed this. He said, While I was with them, speaking of the disciples, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them. Not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now go back to this passage in verse 9. It says, This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. 
of those you, whom you gave me, I have lost not one. So it's so interesting that Jesus has both the will and the power to protect his own through this life. Verse 10 says, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut his right ear. The name servant was Malchus. So rewind, earlier in the day, when the disciples were in the upper room with Jesus, Peter had vowed during that time that he was willing to lay down his life for Jesus. It's in John 13, 37. And at that time, Jesus had responded to Peter's boast by prophesying that actually, in fact, before the rooster crows three times, Peter is going to deny him. And now it seems that Peter is really fierce to try to prove his loyalty to Jesus. And so he draws out his sword and he's ready right now to lay down his life for the Lord with his sword. The problem is that Peter's impetuousness, which is characteristic of Peter, is actually in rebellion to God's will because Peter is actually hindering the work of Jesus right now, the work that Jesus is trying to accomplish by nearly getting himself killed in the process. And at the very moment that Jesus is working really hard to try to establish their safety, Jesus is putting himself between them and the soldiers to protect them. And here Peter whips out his sword and cuts off the ear of the, of the servant. Why do you think that Peter made such a grave error in judgment? Why would he have made such a grave error in judgment? Why would he have missed the moment that was happening here in the garden and done something that was so contrary to what Jesus was working to accomplish? I think there's a couple of thoughts about this. I mean, possibly it was because he had argued with Jesus. When Jesus had told him that he would deny him, rather than believe him and be on guard against pride and temptation, he argued with Jesus. He said, no, it's not going to happen. I'm going to lay my life down for you. Maybe it was also because he fell asleep in the garden instead of praying as Jesus had requested. Temptation was coming and the disciples needed to pray and be ready. He fell asleep. Maybe it was because he spoke up and he put himself front and center in this moment when he was supposed to be listening and trusting that Jesus had it under control. Maybe it was because he was mimicking Jesus' enemies by drawing out his sword and really seeking to create the very fight that they expected. Jesus didn't need Peter's protection. He could have summoned a legion of angels to deliver him if he had wanted. And Matthew tells us that in Matthew 26, 52. It says, Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? Wow. So Jesus immediately steps in and he intervenes to protect Peter and the rest of the disciples by healing Malchus's ear. And truly, it's a miracle that the disciples got out of the garden alive. Thank you, Lord. One day, Peter is going to learn that his only viable weapon for, for, for battling spiritual battles is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God and prayer. In verse 11, it says, So Jesus says to Peter, Put your sword back in its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Certainly, <laughs> the one who simply spoke his name and caused all the men to fall to the ground is the one who could have reached out and is the one who did reach out and touch the ear of the servant and healed. He's also the one who could have called down 72,000 angels to protect him. So he's also the one who could have avoided arrest in this moment if he had wanted to. If he had chosen to, if he has the power to speak his name and men fall to the ground, the power to heal the body in the moment, the power of 72,000 angels at his command, certainly he has the power to have resisted arrest if he had chosen to. But you see, instead, he submits himself to his father's will so that the scripture will be fulfilled just as it is written. And this is where we see the majesty of Jesus as he demonstrates that he is not powerless to save himself, but he is actually willing to drink this cup as his father has planned. You know, the, the point that I think we can see here about Jesus is that he is the great I am who is sovereign over all things. We see throughout this entire scene that, that he is sovereign. He is in control of everything that is happening here. The Lordship of Jesus is so evident in his sovereign control over all the circumstances of his betrayal and arrest. 
You know, through this entire scene, Jesus remained in control of the circumstances that were happening. He remained in control of his enemies and in his responses to everything that was happening. Just think about it. He orchestrated the events so that he would be in the right place at the right time for his arrest. He purposefully orchestrated everything to be in that moment. He was able to disable his enemies with three words, and yet he chose to let them bind him up and take him away. He was able to protect his disciples despite Peter's rash provocation, and he was able to remain cool and collect despite the agony of his heart and the deep despair that he experienced just moments earlier because of his foreknowledge about what lay ahead for him according to his father's plan. Jesus was fully in control and yet completely submitted himself to his enemies because he was obedient to his father's perfect plan. He's sovereign. What does that mean when we say that God is sovereign? I'm so glad we get to talk about this today because God's sovereignty is something that we're thinking a lot about when we're living right now in a season that seems very chaotic, very out of control, very fraught with, you know, uncertainties, very dangerous. So what does it mean that God is sovereign? Well, the dictionary defines the word sovereign as having supreme power and authority and being outstanding in excellence and effectiveness. Sounds like God to me, doesn't it to you? The Bible teaches us that God's sovereignty means means this. It means that he is in control of his universe, that he determines the outcome of all things according to his wise purposes. He has absolute authority and rule over his creation. Nothing is outside the scope of God's rule. He controls and guides all events for his glory and for our good. All events, even the events that we're experiencing right now. We know that from the beginning of time, God ordained that his son would be crucified on the Passover. So no matter what these men planned or plotted, this was exactly how it was going to happen because God is sovereign. And certainly there are many things in our world right now that cause us to feel uncertain about our future. You know, we're living with disease. Uh, We've got disunity in the world politically and racially. We've got acts of disobedience happening every night in the city of Portland, dissension between people and ideologies and religions and political views. There's a general sense of distrust about just about everything. I mean, it is, it is a, a, we thought we only had COVID and now it's one thing after another, after another. This is a crazy time of life. Is God still sovereign? Yes, he is. But God, and God has a plan. He has a plan for our world. And he's actually working behind the scenes of all of this to execute his will. He is orchestrating history and moving our world towards the return of Jesus Christ, which is what he ordained would happen in his word long ago. And aren't you more and more eager for that day than ever before? And because God is sovereign, the best thing that we can do with our lives is participate with him in his spiritual work. You know, we need to wake up from spiritual slumber. And I believe that this season that we're living in right now is a big fat alarm clock. It is a a call to wake up from spiritual slumber. We have been so comfortable and so pampered, and it's time to grow up and be disciplined and be ready for whatever lies ahead. I believe that we must surrender our hearts to God. You know, surrender is tough for us as human beings because control is an issue that I think most of us deal with. We want control. It's a characteristic of our fallen nature to want to be self-sufficient and autonomous and independent from God. But the reality is, is that we aren't in control. No matter how hard we try to convince ourselves that we are, we are not in control. So we get angry and we get frustrated when we realize that we're not in control. And often that causes us to lash out at other people or become emotional when we feel out of control. But submission to Christ is the precursor to making really good, wise, obedient decisions. The problem with Peter is that he wasn't submitted in this instance. He was refusing to relinquish control to God's plan. And instead, he tried to make things better by taking things into his own hands. But truly, it was disaster. So let's turn that back on ourselves for a moment and ask, in what area of your life and my life are we fighting with God for control? And how's it going? Are you miserable? 
Are you finding that your life is becoming more complicated and more painful as you're trying to fight with God with, for control? What would it take for you and for myself to simply surrender and trust that the Lord is in control and He has the very best plan of our lives and He is present in every circumstance? He loves us. He loves you and He loves me and He desires to care for our needs. He is working to protect us and He's challenging us to stop living by sight and to live by faith. You know, Jesus modeled perfect obedience to his Father's will. So in what area of your life is God calling you to surrender and obey him today? It's truly a choice that we have to make, and it's a choice we have to make every single day. And so my challenge to you and my challenge to myself is, will you trust him? Where do you need to trust him? What do you need to relinquish to him, to surrender, to submit to him? And and will you obey his word? Will you be wise and discerning? And will you um, determine that you're going to walk by faith and not by sight as we go through these uncertain times? So let me pray for God to help us with that today. Father, we come before you and confess that we too often battle for control with you. And that's just ridiculous because you're the only one who's in control. And we're so grateful you are because we, we are powerless and we're not wise, and we would be impetuous like Peter if we were to try to take control in our own hands. So we come to you today, Lord, and ask for help. Give us wisdom. Show us what we need to to relinquish to you and how we need to choose today to walk by faith and not by sight, to believe and to trust that you are sovereign, that you have all things in control and you are working fully to bring about a situation that will will result in your glory and our good. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for spending my birthday with me. And on Monday, we're going to examine another facet of Jesus' identity as King of the Jews. And we're going to see this title as we get to the cross. And so will you join me on Monday? In the meantime, have a very, very great day and a great weekend.